Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yo. We're a couple minutes late, and my apologies for my tardiness. I had Heather uh, post something on there. Um, I had to meet with my um, uh, supervisor that's uh, in charge of my clinical hours that I'm doing and meeting with him to go over what I've done so far for my class. And that's our director of admissions, John Hamm, and that meeting ran a little longer than anticipated, so my apologies for that. And, uh, but that's why we're starting a little bit late this evening, so for those of you who have been anxiously awaiting, we're alive and ready to go. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, let's, let's give people a few minutes to see the notification and then go on. So while you guys are doing that, uh, we're going to just kind of hang out for a few moments and wait. See, I have Mary Ann looking at the screen so you can tell me who's on, how many people are on. Anybody who can't see it? It's somebody making comments. Oh, yeah, we got two, three, a couple people watching. All right. I said it ain't going to go so well. <laughs> All right. Well, what we're going to do is we got people coming on. We're going to go ahead and start because I know we're a little late. We're probably still going to take an hour, so we'll be, we'll be ending about 10 minutes later than we normally do, which is okay. But we're going to be in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, that's where we're starting. For those of you who did your homework <clears throat> um, and, and read the first four chapters of Isaiah for background, it's kind of important that you understand what's going on in the book of Isaiah, especially chapter 1, because that's where the study is going to focus on. And if you're like me, you got to take a lot of notes. And um, you got to make notes in the margins and do cross-reference things. And believe it or not, I didn't cross-reference anything during this chapter. Everything that I that I took notes on was was uh, either from memory or from studying Isaiah before. And um, if I would have did all the cross-references, because I have a center column in my Bible, I probably would have been in two weeks developing this, this uh, lesson. Because there's a whole lot of scripture references. And Isaiah references itself a lot. If you if you have a good study Bible or a, a Bible with a with a reference column in the middle, you will see that every verse has several verses that you can reference, and a lot of those references are later chapters in Isaiah, which is really cool. If you think about it. Um, so Isaiah is a very pivotal book, and why is why is Isaiah one of my favorite books? I'm glad you asked. Why Isaiah is one of my favorite books? Isaiah is one of my favorite books is because it was written about 600. The 700 years, roughly 650 years, before Jesus Christ was born. Now, most people are like, why is that important? I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you want to know why it's so important about the time frame that Isaiah was written. Because Isaiah was written about 650 years before Jesus was born, and it's a pre-exilic book. And pre-exilic means it was pre-exile for the nation of Judah. So it was written before Judah was in the captivity right, of Babylon. So that's another significant thing. But that's not why Isaiah is one of my favorite books. And that's not why it's significant that it was written about 650 years before Christ was born. The significance between Isaiah being written and Christ being born 650 years later is because we have one of the most specific prophecies of Jesus Christ's life in the book of Isaiah 650 years before he walked the earth. That's significant. It's so significant, in fact, that there are many scholars, and I use that term loosely, that can't believe that Isaiah had a prophecy 650 years before Jesus walked the earth that he was going to walk the earth. So they don't believe that Isaiah was written by Isaiah. Interestingly enough, there is a, a theory out there that I had to learn about in seminary, because it's out there, it exists, that there is a Deuro-Isaiah, or a second Isaiah, that the some of the prophecies about the exile were written by Isaiah, and then the rest of Isaiah was finished hundreds of years later after they came back to their promised land. Then that is just simply not so. There is not enough evidence to prove that Isaiah was broken up over a period of time. There is not enough evidence to prove anything because the, the syntax is uh, a term that references the grammar and inconsistent structure and those things. The syntax of Isaiah proves that it was written by one person. The context, because of the flow of it, it was written by one person. And because Isaiah claims to be the author, is enough reason why we should believe it was written by one person. And if that's not enough, if God wanted it to be written by two people, it would have two different names. Right? So those are some interesting tidbits about the book of Isaiah. And as we as we go through this lesson, I was telling you, Tina and Mary and Billy this evening that that as we go through this, um, 
each week I'm going to try to remember to put some tidbits about Isaiah in there to let you know why it's a special book. Why it's, it's a special book. And Isaiah is just an awesome book. Isaiah has one of my favorite passages in it, and we'll get to that next week. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, the call of Isaiah, where he says, Here I am, send me. I love it. Can't wait. I'm so excited about it. I want to jump to that lesson, but I, I digress. We have, to, we have to go first things first. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have, have a few moments of understanding here before we read. And I know everybody's like, Justin, just hurry up and get on with it. Well, I can't. Because this is so exciting for me because Isaiah is such an important book. It's such a pivotal book in the whole entire Old Testament. Because it it just consolidates a lot of theories and, and um, theology and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the theme of reconciliation in the Bible that is in Isaiah. So it's a very impactful book. It's very long. And there's a lot of great information. So what I want us to understand is, is that this part of Isaiah that we're going to study, before we read the passage, the vocal passage, this part of Isaiah that we're studying is basically a unique opener. We don't actually learn the call of Isaiah until Isaiah chapter 6. So, chapters 1 through 6, Isaiah starts speaking. We know it's Isaiah speaking because it says so in verse 1 of chapter 1. But we don't understand the call of Isaiah until chapter 6, which that makes it unique from a lot of the other prophets. Not only is Isaiah pre-exilic, which means it's pre-exile of Judah, it's also, also a major prophet. A major prophet. And the book of and Isaiah takes place when it's written. There are some minor prophets that are involved during that time also. So, Let's, uh, enough about the history of Isaiah and the background of it. We'll learn some more about that next week. Let's, let's look at what is Isaiah doing in these first four chapters, and predominantly in the first chapter that we're going to study tonight. What's it about? Why are we reading this? Why are we studying this? And how on earth does it apply to our lives today? Well, I'm glad you have those questions because we're going to cover that. Why is Isaiah important? We kind of covered that already. What is he talking about in this section of Isaiah. What he's talking about is this. Judah's sin. Sin. Their sinfulness. Their relationship with the Lord has basically become non-existent. The people, if you've read, if you've read the study guide or you read the chapters or you read both, you'll learn that the nation of Israel, or specifically Judah in this instance, has forgotten where they came from. And they have taken for granted the relationship they have with God, and they have gone about their religious rituals and traditions without really thinking about what they're doing or why they're doing it or who they're doing it for. So basically, the, the opening thought here basically tells us in our quarterly, our, our, our curriculum guide that we're following, is uh, relationships can become stale and fade into the background. As a result, our relationships can fail and can catch us off guard. So the first question I have today is have we ever taken a relationship for granted? That's in the book. But I have a more intimate question for you tonight. A more intimate question. Where is your relationship at with God? I don't really care if you've ever taken a relationship for granted because everybody has. That's a, that's a no-brainer. But where is your relationship with God? Because what we're going to go over today is going to challenge every single person within the sound of my voice to examine their relationship with God. Because we all should be doing that regularly anyway. But some of the things we're going to talk about, some of the things we're going to bring up, may be a little uh, touchy to some individuals, uh, including myself at times. Because all of us are guilty of coming before the Lord without pure motives at some point in time or another. All of us are. So let's 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 understand this this context. Uh, Judah is, has been very bad, right? Um, there's a condemnation of, uh, of God's people, right? There, and um, this is basically, I, Isaiah is portraying a, uh, a prosecutor <laughs> for a lawsuit against the nation of Judah, and God is the plaintiff. That's the best way to look at this, if you think about it. And what is, he, what is God suing the nation of Judah for? Suing them for breach of contract. Breach of covenant. So there's a covenant, there's a contract. And a covenant involved in a contract are very similar terms. A marriage covenant, a marriage contract, that's a, that's a unique way to look at it also. So a covenant is between two people, right? And it's sealed, consummated. A marriage contract or a covenant is sealed or consummated with a man and wife coming together. 
And at Mount Sinai, God came together with the nation of Israel and consummated a relationship with them with the Ten Commandments. And then the Levitical law and so on and so forth after that. But it was Ten Commandments, that covenant. So, uh, that the closest thing we have is a marriage, like I said, a marriage uh, covenant or contract. And this, this relationship between God and Judah, or Israel as a whole, was consummated by love. God brought Israel out of, out of Egypt because he loved them. And God loves us because he sent his only begotten son. And we know that because the scriptures tell us so. So this, this Exodus chapter 20, which is where we get the Ten Commandments, is the, the covenantal form of this relationship. And the people have rejected God because they failed to follow the covenant. So they broke it. So God is now basically suing them, or he's filed suit against them, and said this is what's going to happen. If you don't mend your ways. However, one of the unique things about the prophets, especially Isaiah, is he slams Judah for their sins. He slams them. But one of the things he does, as every prophet does, is they offer hope. They come with a message of hellfire, brimstone, and condemnation, and then he offers a message of hope. So what we have to understand here is he has a very unique thing. He's, he's not a very good prosecutor because he tells them they're guilty and then he says, but they're tope. <laughs> he says they're tope. Not, not very many prosecutors do that. So he's unique because he's a prophet of the Lord. The, the people, we talked about this before. What's the purpose of discipline? The purpose of discipline is to change the heart, not change the behavior. Changing the behavior only addresses the symptom. It doesn't address the root cause, which is the heart. So the purpose of this message to the nation of Judah is to change their heart and bring their heart back to God. And if you remember the song, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, you Lord, they can seal it. That's right. What song is that? Come back out of every blessing. One of my favorite hymns. One of my favorite hymns. Because we're prone to wonder and we have to have a heart reflection. We have to have a, we have a spiritual heart attack and we have to be revived and the Lord brings us back to life. So the purpose of God's people was to be a beacon to the other nations of the world. That was their sole purpose, right? And they were failing in that because instead of being a beacon to the other nations of the world, they have assimilated, assimilated to the other cultures. And we're going to get into that here very shortly. So, the biggest thing they do and I think we do today, is we make God out to be a vending machine. That's, that's what the, the, that's the analogy the, the Sunday School Quarterly uses. I use the term genie, but basically my term is more incorrect than the Sunday School book because the nation of Judah, they were following their religious rituals and their traditions and believing that God was going to repay them, right, with blessings and favor. And that's not how it works. They were only doing what they were supposed to do because of what they could get out of it, not because they wanted to do it. So that's, that's, that, was their, that was their problem. So but the, the hope of this message is even if judgment comes, a faithful remnant has a hope in the future. All right. So let's, let's read our, our passage here and we're going to pray. Okay? So we're going to start um, in verse 10. And I want to say it goes to verse 20. Yeah. Verse 10 and verse 20. So I'm reading from the New American Standard. I have a hard time reading the, the King James um, because of the D's and the vowels and the E's and all that stuff. I don't talk like that. So I'm going to read from the New American Standard uh, translation here. And it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Wow. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of the fed cattle. And I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and a solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourself, 
Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. <coughs> Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for today and this time we have together this evening to study from your prophet Isaiah and learn the practical application that we can have in our lives today. Because the same things that Judah struggled with, our nation and our people and the church struggle with today. We have turned away from you and taken our relationship for granted with you. And we have made a mockery of what you designed on this earth. And it's these studies that are going to give us insight that history is repeating itself. And we have two choices, as we always have. Serving God or serving self. So I pray that tonight, as we go through this study, that you will help us. And you will teach us and you will enlighten us and help us to grow in our relationship with you. So that we not only can be stronger and better in our Christian walk, but we can be a better testimony for you and be better boldness and have more courage to share the gospel with those around us. To hold each other accountable, to lovingly speak to each other and lift up each other, admonish each other and exhort the gospel. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's get started. Got a couple things here. Verses 10 and 11, the first thing he says is, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So he's basically calling the, na the nation of Judah, Jerusalem, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a slap in the face. That's pretty hard right there. What did he do to them people? He, he obliterated them from the face of the earth. And he's basically saying, you people are no better than they are. God, God must be pretty mad. I mean, I, I can just imagine from back in my Navy days, if 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 vulgar language was used, and how many adjectives he would have used to describe these people. Think about that. Their lives are that much of a mockery that God is calling them through the prophet Isaiah, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's pretty bad, don't you think? I believe it was Billy Graham. I think it was in the nineties. I don't remember when he, when he said it, but I know he, at one time he said it. He said. If God was to look at what the United States was doing today, he should resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize. And that was then. <laughs> I wonder what Billy Graham would say right now if he was alive. Maybe that's why the Lord took him home. Probably wouldn't have been able to handle it. Mm. Anyway, here, here. So we've talked about this before. There's two words in the English language that, are, that, that go together very well. Hear and listen. But in Hebrew, in Hebrew, the word hear, right? The word hear means or implies obedience. In English, we typically say, I heard you. But if we listen, that means we actually did something. That's the obedience side of that. But in Hebrew, the word hear implies obedience. So the first thing that the word here does is, is it implies obedience, but the second thing, or perhaps the preeminent thing, is when Isaiah speaks and he says, hear the word of the Lord. He's speaking with the authority of God, just like Moses did in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel. In other words, pay attention. Yes, pay attention. Heed my words, but he's speaking with Oh, when he's speaking with the authority of God, and it's identifying that he is the authority of God, because he's using the same terminology that Moses did when God spoke through Moses in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the beginning of the Shema. The Lord your God is one. So, God was consistent in the way he dealt with Israel. That's one point we can take from this, okay? It's not just an opinion of God. Their actions reflected those of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is mad. God has a, God has a commandment to, that they, they are to love him and obey him. And he has that right. Why does he have that right? Because he rescued them out of Egypt. He is their father. As we have God as our father, he expects and should expect obedience, should he not, from his children. So God speaking 
uh, through Isaiah, but when Isaiah speaks, they know it's the word of God, and hearing implies obedience, okay? And obedience follows the command if the words are truly heard. O-B-D-E-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, obedience. There's a song that I learned when I was in South Florida working with the, the children's ministry, with the children's minister there, youth minister there, and it goes O-B-D-E-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, obedience is the very best way to show that we believe. You like that? That's pretty good, huh? I always thought I was smart enough to think of something like that. But I didn't. O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E, -E -E, obedience is the very best way to show that we believe. Think about that. So the people, the rulers, now see, the interesting thing about the Hebrew culture is God holds those accountable that need to be held accountable. And he's actually, in this instance, more or less, talking to the whole group. But who does God address? He doesn't really address the peons. The leaders. Whose fault is it that the people are going astray? The people in charge. Because people are a reflection of what? Their leadership. Right? So if the, if the leadership is doing wrong, the people are going to be wrong too. The apple don't fall far from the tree. That's who they're going to look at. That's right. They're going to look at the leaders. And the people, the people are looking at the leaders, so God's saying, hey, you peoples, you need to come to Jesus' meeting. The people are only interested in their own pleasures and needs, and that, that's, that's selfish. Selfish. If the leaders are selfish, the people are going to be selfish. And we can go back to 2 Kings. We can look at Solomon's life. And we can see in, in, in Chronicles. We can look at the Chronicles of, of King Solomon. And we can look at those things. And we can see that as Solomon went a certain way, the country went a certain way. And that's why, short, that's why shortly after Solomon died, the nation was split into Israel and, the, and, and Judah. Because his son Rehoboam was selfish and arrogant and did not follow the, the way of the sages and the wisdom. And Jeroboam took the northern ten tribes and Rehoboam got the, got the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Because he followed the example of his father in his latter years and Solomon wasn't, did not act very wise in his latter years. And that's what happened. So the, the rulers had led the people astray and the people had willingly cooperated. So they're just as at fault as the leaders are. Because they didn't stand up for what was right. So they choose sin and the rejection of the loving God. See, every time we choose sin, we willingly reject the loving God. People think that they can accept, and I'm preaching now, so forgive me, but people think they can accept Jesus Christ and do what they want to do. It don't work like that. When you accept Jesus Christ, and I know because I struggled with this in my early years as a young adult, you cannot accept Jesus Christ and talk how you want and do what you want and still claim to know Jesus. It don't work that way. It ain't right. You can't do it. Because when you choose sin, you reject God. Period, case, closed, in a sentence. There is no but, uh, no, no. Ain't, ain't none of that but. But, 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 that's what a motorboat said. That, that's not what we're doing here tonight. So he says to them, in verse, that was only the first verse, so bear with me. <laughs> the, the next verse says, says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of your burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. Man! Mm. What was the purpose of those rituals? What was the purpose of sacrificing to God? The purpose of sacrificing to God was twofold. To bring about communion and fellowship. With the Holy God. It was to atone for sin. It was to atone for other things. Guilt offering, peace offering, wave offerings, all these different. Go back to Leviticus and read all that stuff in Exodus. But the purpose of the sacrifices was for God to have communion with his people. Where did God sit? But in that case, weren't they making them offer? Yes, we're going to get there. We're almost there. We're going to get to heaven. Get to heaven. Where, where, where did God sit? The mercy seat, right inside the temple. So the mercy seat was in the holy of holies, 
Then you had the holy place, which was outside the holy holy. Then you had the outer court, then you had the altar outside the temple. What was significant about that? They had to make an offering to the Lord, who sat on the mercy seat, who judged the nation of Israel and Judah, right? And when they come there, and they, they have the wrong motives, can they can they have can they have communion and fellowship with the Lord if their heart's not right? Can you have communion with the Holy God if your heart's not right? If you're not holy, if you're not purified? No, you can't. So that's what we're trying to tell them. So let's recap real quick. Who's at fault? The leaders are at fault for leading people astray, but the followers have just as much blame as the leaders do because they should know better too. Because it wasn't like um, the, the, the rules of the Lord were only given to one select group of people. They were given for all to see. The priests thought them astray, but the people knew it was wrong and they followed along anyway. And the sad part is, is that this is what happened. This is what happened. If you look back and you remember in the New Testament, one of Paul's things was he had to fight the Greek culture. And they had a pantheon of gods, right? And in the Greek culture, because they had a pantheon of gods, what did the Greeks in the Greco-Roman empires do to appease the gods? They made sacrifices, right? And they thought that if they made sacrifices, they would appease the gods, and the gods would be nice to them, right? Well, that wasn't something that the Greco-Roman empires made up. That was back here in these days, too, in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, God specifically says, don't sacrifice your children to Molech. Was the God of fire. And people would do that. The nation of Israel did it. That was one of their sins. They sacrificed their children by burning them alive in the fire to Molech. Because they thought that they had to appease some God that didn't exist. So now they're doing the same thing to God. They're following these rituals as some sort of payment for some divine favor. They're, they're seeking to appease him because they're going to get something out of it. That's not why we offer ourselves to God. We don't offer ourselves to God because we might get rich. Or we might get a car, or we might get some fancy job. When Paul says in Romans 12, 1, to offer yourself a living sacrifice before the Lord, it's because of what God's done for you, not so that he can do something else for you. We do it in, basically, in, in lovingness, in appreciation for him being our father and sending Jesus to die for us. That's why we offer ourselves a living sacrifice, and that's what these people were supposed to do too, because he rescued them from the nation of Egypt, from a land of oppression, to lift them up and make them a solid people. And they fail miserably. So that's why God's man. And God said, I don't want your stinking offerings no more. Take them back. They don't do nothing for me. It ain't for me to begin with. I don't need you to burn animals for me. You need to burn animals for you so that you can be purified and come before me with a shedding of blood for remission of sin so that you can have holy communion and fellowship with me. But if the heart's not right, I ain't taking it. How about Cain and Abel? Abel offered his sacrifice, Cain offered his sacrifice, but we're not really told why God accepted Abel and didn't and rejected Cain. But one can only speculate that Cain's heart wasn't right. He was the elder son. And he killed his younger brother. Because Abel had favor and Cain did. What's up with that? His heart wasn't right. And he proved it with the way he reacted. One thing I've noted in my, in my Bible is Psalm 51, 16 and 17. And we're going to turn here real quick. I'm going to tell you what it says. And if this takes a little bit longer than I got, I'm sorry. But this is, this is, in my opinion, good stuff. Psalm 51, you don't have to turn here, but I'm reading to you. This is what David said. After Nathan the prophet confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba. For he's speaking to God in his prayer. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. That's what God wants. Sorry, I'm preaching. It's getting good up in here. Should have put on my suit. Right, let's read the next verse. 12 through 14. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you the scrambling of my course? He's like, who told you to come to me? That's a rhetorical question. Who gave them the, who gave them the order that they were supposed to come? God. He asked the question that they already knew the answer to. More importantly, he asked the question he already knew the answer to. Why are you coming to me? 
The, the answer in Leviticus basically is God himself over them. So why was he saying he no longer wanted them? Because their motivation wasn't right. That people were supposed to obey and love God. And this repentant sacrificial activity, right, without love for God, was an empty affair, a mockery of the very institution that God installed. And because it's a mockery, it was meaningless. Therefore, people might as well not even come at all. Because it basically, they looked at God and they said, right across the face. Almost like they were being sarcastic. I'm glad God's got a lot of patience. Because if our kids acted like those people did to God, they'd be picking their teeth up off the ground. Back in the day, that's what I was told. One time my dad told me, if I were to talk to my dad the way you just talked to me, I'd be picking my teeth up off the floor. <laughs> in, 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 the, in, the, in the King James, it says, bring no more vain oblations. And so I looked in the, in the, um, the New American Center, it says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. He's basically saying none of what you're doing is worthwhile. And this is where we really get to understand that the contrite heart is what God desires. That's what he wants. The heart, the, the internal motivation, desire to serve Him and follow Him and love and obey Him. But instead of Israel being an example to the world, they assimilate to the cultures around them, like we've already said. And they don't have the circumcision of the heart. We're going to touch on that in Ezekiel here in a minute. See, their, their lack of contrition and repentance and reverence as a motive, well, showed their lack of respect for what God had done for them, what God allowed them to become. And really, in all honesty, the way that the old Greco Roman system worked was basically bribery. They had to bribe the gods to be nice. And that's not how God works. You can't buy God. That's sad that there are people even to this day that believe they have to bribe their gods to obtain favor. I'll tell you about my God. You can't bribe my God. He can't be bought. Because he already owns everything. <laughs> Uh, I know this is supposed to be a Bible study, and I can't help but just think about that. You can't buy a guy because he owns everything. You can't make a deal with him because he owns everything. Hey, I'll make a deal with you, God. I can't imagine what God must do when someone says, I'll make a deal with you. I wonder how hard he laughs. I wonder if he laughs so hard the whole ground shakes. You know what I'm saying? Maybe that's why California has so many earthquakes, because he laughs. Probably said, this poor idiot did that. That's right. He's probably like, those poor souls ain't got a clue. Probably says that about us too. But how does this relate practically to us? Oh man, this is where I'm going to step in. Everybody get your boots on. You know how this relates practically to us? I ain't never seen anywhere in the Bible where it says you're going to go to hell if you don't go to church. I've seen in the Bible where it says you shouldn't forsake the gathering of the brethren. I've seen in the Bible where it says we're supposed to live in community with each other as Christians. I've seen in the Bible where man is not meant to live alone. Which means we're supposed to live in community with each other and have fellowship with each other. That's why you come to church. You don't come to church to get mad. You come to church because you desire a fellowship and a communion with the saints, which is what the Bible teaches from the beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation, from the table of contents to the mass. That's what it teaches. To have communion and fellowship with each other. You want to know why the church in the first century was so powerful and strong? Because they lived in communion together. You want to know why the church in the 21st century is falling apart? Because we don't live together anymore in harmony and community and fellowship. We seek to do what we want to do. We come in with the wrong motives and the wrong spirit and the wrong desires. And we do what we got to do to check our box and we go on about our business. And we wonder why our church falls apart 
apart. We wonder why our nation falls apart. We wonder why the communities fall apart. Because the family falls apart because they don't have God at the center of it. And when the family falls apart, the community, society, the country, and the world will fall. Because people don't get married for the right reason. Luckily, I say luckily, what a blessing it is that God fixed my stupidity when I was a young man and Lisa's when she was a young woman because we didn't get married for the right reasons. Heaven helped us and we realized the error in our ways and we love each other like we're supposed to. And it ain't easy. I don't know how my wife loves me to begin with. Even now, let well, alone 16 years ago. But that's why it's important to have the right motivation to do something. Because when we look at our relationships that we have in the world today, what is our motivation? What is our desire? Why am I here? Should be the question we always ask. Because I really love people. Yeah, I do like hanging out with people. But why are we here? Why are we doing what we are doing? That's the question we should be asking. And what we should be asking is, how can I glorify God with what I'm doing? And if the answer is, I can't, then you ought not be doing it. Because you're not living a, offering yourself as a living sacrifice, right? Okay. Let's move on. Verse 15. There's only one verse here, so this may take a while. And it says, so when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. So let, let's cover the last part first. Why are their hands covered with blood? Because of the violence toward each other. They don't care about each other. They're out for number one, themselves. O-N-E. There ain't no I in team. But there's an I in win. And that's what they were doing. Out for number one. Numero uno. They didn't care about their fellow man. Well, that ain't right. That ain't biblical. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. In Leviticus chapter 19. Who's your neighbor? Everybody. And you come down on Sunday. Ironically enough, I'm starting to really, really believe that God gave me that message at the last minute on Sunday because it ties so close into this lesson tonight. We're supposed to love everybody. We're supposed to look out for other people's needs above our own. Put other people first. That's full self sacrifice and love. Man, can you imagine if Israel would have gotten it right? Jesus would have never had to come. If they would have been the example that they were supposed to be, Jesus wouldn't have needed to come because we would have all understood that we should love and worship God. It just goes to show you that nobody can get it right except for Jesus Christ. Because God's own chosen people that he made a covenant with made a mockery of him time and time and time and time and time again. I tell you, they, they say the patience of Job, they use that a lot in the example, they should say the patience of God. Because ain't nobody got patience, more patience than God. Infinite patience. As many times as we've messed up and he still loves us, he ain't destroyed the earth yet. At least, not this time. He did it once before. <laughs> not, not this time. Okay, so, <clears throat> interestingly enough, in number chapter 6, there's a, a passage of scripture from verses 24 to 26 called the Aaronic Benediction. And God speaks in that, and we'll, we'll go ahead and read it. This is, this is the Aaronic Benediction, Numbers 24. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. i got to get my thing here. Okay, he says, <clears throat> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So he speaks upon showing his face to them twice. Okay, now that's significant. And, and the court leader kind of breaks that down. But he, um, when, you, when he says, I will hide my eyes from you, and um, I will not hear you, he's basically saying he's going to ignore them. Now in Hebrew, in the Jewish culture, that's a slap in the face. Because <clears throat> looking at someone implies they have your attention. When God turns his face from you, you no longer have God's attention. That's a bad place to be. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a parallel. Anybody ever seen a DDG ship, United States Navy ship, a, a guided missile destroyer, a, G, a, a DDG? I encourage every single one of you in the sign of my voice when you get home to look up on the internet, DDG 96. I forget what ship that is. 98, I think it's the USS Kid or something like that. 
Look up Guy Hess of a Story in the United States Navy. Look that up. Google it. Look at the pictures of it. Now, you tell me if you see one of them things rolling up off your coast that you ain't going to have the fear of God in Because they got a lot of guided missiles. They got, it's like a modern day battleship from back in the day. Whole world of constant power. Eee, in space. Right? Okay? So, imagine that. You're, you're in those shoes. You're in a faraway land. You see one of those roll up off your coast. It's not, not a good thing. Right? That's how the people of Israel felt when God said, I no longer hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm no longer with you. I'm no longer listening to you. If that doesn't strike the fear of God into somebody, that God's no longer listening, or in today's age, if we saw a big old DDG rolling off off our coast and we're in some faraway land, we know we're going to have hellfire brimstone right down on us. That's a scary feeling. And the nation of Israel should have been provoked and made to fear what was about to happen. That's why God is speaking to them. I'm not listening to you anymore. You no longer have my ear. You no longer are able to talk to me. I don't hear anything you're telling me because you don't have the right heart to worship me. So I'm done with you. That's scary. But why is this important? Well, it's important because of one thing. This same context helps us understand John 1.1. 1, 1. Helps us understand the deity of Christ. And John 1.1, 1, 1, what's it say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The second, sen the second sentence, the Word was with God, is talking about Jesus. And the word with, in Greek, is actually pros pantheon, which means they were facing each other. An intimate relationship and communication with one another. Why is that significant? Because it says, looking at someone implies they have your attention. It means they were both equal to each other. So that one sentence gives us a little bit of a glimpse into the deity of Christ and why the deity of Christ is so important to understanding that Jesus is God. He's, it basically says you can make as many prayers as you want, but they're meaningless because God's no longer going to accept them. I hope I never get to the point where God doesn't accept my prayers. Can you imagine the God of the entire universe, as much love and patience as he had, is like this, the nation of Israel. Kind of like what you're telling you when your kid throws out a fit, right? Don't give me any attention. And then stop throwing a fit. What you do to your dog anyway? Don't pay attention to them. They ain't, they ain't minding you. You don't mind them. I no longer mind because you don't want to remember. The, the, the key here, the point to take away is we cannot do whatever we want, right? And expect God to care. It don't work that way. God's always going to care about us. But as any father would, he's going to discipline us, should we need it. Sometimes, we need to, sometimes we need to come to Jesus meeting, right? A spiritual cleansing. So he says in verse 16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Man, wash clean, put away, and cease. Verse 16, wash yourselves. Clean yourselves. Remove your evil. Cease doing evil. What's he telling them to do? Tell them to wash. What's significant about washing? Cleanliness. Clean, cleanliness. What's it cleansing? Pure. Right? It's, it's purifying. What's it cleansing? When you wash yourself. The outside of the body. That's right. And then purifying the outside of the body, which was a ritual that they had to do to make sure they were clean before they came into the presence of the Lord. But what else was he telling them to do? Make yourself clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease doing evil. Make yourselves clean. What else does that prompt in us to do? Clean your act up. Clean your act up, which is more of an internal cleansing, a spiritual cleansing. Hey, clean yourself up. Go drink a bottle of act right. <laughs> you need to have um, it, it, the, the worship that they had, they actually had a ritual bath, the ritual cleansing. And um, in the um, Mishnah or the Talmud, I think it's in the Mishnah, uh, it's the Hebrew literature, basically you have the Torah, then you have 
have the um, Mishnah and then the Talmud, and they're basically commentaries from the rabbis over the centuries and millennia that gave instructions on how to fulfill the laws, the 613 commandments that the Jews are supposed to follow. And there's actually a um, Chabad in uh, Kerry, it's a, a Hasidic Jewish synagogue, and they actually, you can go on their website, it's free, you don't have to pay anything, you can research what their rituals are and how they pray every day and what they're supposed to do. And there's actually a pool that they have at that synagogue that has flowing water, which is a requirement for ritual cleansing, okay? And you have to dip so many times to clean yourself for certain ceremonies and purification things. And God is saying, you need to do that. But while you do that, you need to clean your act up on the inside, too. Because you can't just clean the outside, which is why Jesus calls the Pharisees a bunch of whitewashed walls. They look good on the outside, they're like a 50 year old pop. They look good and shiny and all, all gleamy, and they smell good and taste good on the outside, but on the inside, they're nasty, gooey, chewy, you get stuck all in your teeth and everything like that. They're nasty. Tootsie Roll Pop. My favorite analogy, it applies in. Tootsie Roll Pop. Putting away all the sources of ritual impurity. So cleansing ourselves physically and spiritually helps us get rid of all the bad stuff. Okay, and then he says in verse 17, learn to do well, seek judgment, or in the New American Standard, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the widow, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. Now I got another passage of scripture, one of my favorites. We're gonna, if I can find it, it's one of the minor prophets. Oh, there it is. Found it. <clears throat> he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 8. My, my friend Jeremy Davis turned me on to that verse, and I have to say it's one of my favorites. One of my top 10. Maybe top 20. I don't know. I'll tell you whenever my other top 10 comes out. One of my top 10. So you have to have a change of heart, okay? Um, the reason is for discipline, right? Self-discipline. We talked about discipline a couple Sundays ago. I forget how many weeks ago we talked about discipline. And discipline has a positive connotation. We talked about it in our, in our study in Proverbs, the last time we had uh, our last Bible study series. Discipline. It normally has a negative connotation, but it's actually good. When we are disciplined, we are trained to handle ourselves a certain way. And we get that way because we continually cleanse ourselves. We take a bath every day, just about. Right? Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe you don't need a bath every day. But once a week, maybe. Go down to the creek, shower up a little bit, whatever. Once a month. I don't know. Whatever you do, when, yeah, when, when, you, when, you, when you cleanse yourself, you cleanse yourself. It's a routine. You're disciplined to cleanse yourself because you want good personal hygiene. Well, we should have good spiritual hygiene. How do we get good spiritual hygiene and cleanse ourselves? What's a couple ways we can have good spiritual hygiene? Read your Bible. Man, that's an awesome concept. Pray. What's another way? Pray. Prayer. That's another. Because what does prayer do? Communicates with God. It communicates with God through who? Through Jesus. Through Jesus the Son. And who prays for us when we can't pray for ourselves? The Holy Spirit. Man, you got the whole Trinity involved. That's a beautiful thing. So that's what we should do. We cleanse ourselves spiritually. I mean, we cleanse ourselves physically every day. How, how often do we cleanse ourselves spiritually? Every day? Once a week? Once a month? I bet, you, I bet you if we cleanse ourselves spiritually as much as we cleanse ourselves physically, it would be a better place to live. Because there's some people who, who stink spiritually. They so rank God doesn't even want to talk to them. That's a bad place to be. When you're so clean physically, but you're so dirty spiritually. Mm. God desires a change of heart. Does he not? Romans 12, 2, don't conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed, transformed. We talked about that in our study in Romans. That was two studies ago. You guys remember that word transformed? comes from the Greek word uh, metamorphomai, which is the base word for the English metamorphosis, which is an, a whole complete change. Let God come in and change and rearrange you. How about this? Ezekiel 36. 26. Yeah, that's fine. Ezekiel. How about pass it? 36. 36, 26. Moreover, this is God speaking, I will give you a new heart 
and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinance. Man, that's pretty good stuff. He takes our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh, but only if we're disciplined enough to take it. All right? So how do we accomplish, how do we accomplish, how do we accomplish this spiritual cleansing? How do we accomplish it? I got another passage of scripture for you. In case you, not, not that you guys would have expected anything less. <clears throat> Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your son, and shall talk with them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as bundles on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Man, that's how you, that's how you do it. Right there. I'm going to say it again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Mm. That's the Shema. Beautiful, beautiful writing. Beautiful Hebrew poetic poetry. Let's look at verses 18 and um, 19. He says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. Come now, let's reason together. It says here that the verb translate reason uh, implies an idea of bringing it into a quarrel. So God's saying, hey, let's settle this out of court. I don't want to sue you people. You're my chosen people. I love you, and I want you to love me. So I'm a reasonable person. So let's, let's sit down and talk about this. Let's have a glass of sweet tea. Let's have, let's have a fried chicken meal, because he's bad. Let's have a fish fry. Just do it. Yeah, I ain't getting none, but that's another story. We'll talk about that later. So God says, let's have a fish fry. Let's have a, let's have a fellowship meal together. Let's have dinner on the ground. So they have dinner on the ground. He said, I don't want to sue you. I don't want to break this contract. I don't even want you to break this contract no more. But I tell you what. Even though your sins are scarlet, they're going to be white as snow. And even though they're red like crimson, they'll be white, they'll be like wool. Beautiful white wool. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. We, we got to wait to get verse 20. We can't go that far yet. They have a chance to repent. Man, I tell you what, God's a cool God. He's a gracious God, merciful God. He says, I know all you people have been, have been, um, not doing what you ought to do, but instead of filing this lawsuit and letting, the, and letting me be the judge during executioner or wiping you off the face of the planet, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to let you reconcile with me. I'm going to give you a settlement that I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. If you. Yeah, that's, that's a conditional statement. The interesting thing is he says if. If you go back and you look back in the Old Testament, all the covenants, even the New Testament, there's a whole lot of ifs. If you do this, then you can have this. If you do this, then you will get this. If you don't do this, then you don't get that. <laughs> While well, God want, did not want the ritual relationship, he wanted the relationship and wanted them to follow his commandments with a pure and clean heart. That's all God wants is a pure and clean heart. To obey and follow him. Interestingly enough, it's kind of ironic that something read... <clears throat> can transform to something white. I remember when I was in BBS when I was saved when I was a little boy, seven years old, they had construction paper. During that, they used to do it up here in BBS, they used construction paper to show the different colors, black and red and white, and there's a couple other colors in there that you don't remember what it was for. <clears throat> but your, your black stained with sin, and with the blood of Jesus, it can make that black turn to white. That's pretty much what I all remember. <laughs> I don't remember anything else about that presentation with the construction paper, but your black stain with sin, you pour red on it with the blood of Jesus, and then the black turns to white. That's all I remember. You remember, you remember the report for it. Yeah, I, I remember. Yeah, don't part of matter. I remember. 
But see, because there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. Even in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do? He made loin coverings for them out of an animal. And we have no choice but to believe that was the first sacrifice, the shedding of blood for remission of sin. Because he let them live. Keep them out of the garden, but he let them live. Mm. Let's think about this. <clears throat> so we're talking about this change from the inside out, right? And, and the change only results from the divine blessing and grace and mercy that he bestows on us, like he does with Israel here, and Judah here. Gives them this choice. Ultimately, we know the end of the story. We know what Judah did. It just kept, kept on and kept on. They had some good kings here and there. But if you look back at verse 1 of, of chapter 1, Isaiah was the prophet of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Four kings. He was the prophet. And if you go back and you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, you see blessings and you see the, uh, I want to say you see the curses in chapter 32 of um, what happens. Moses gives, them, gives it to them flat out. They were warned. And God still in his infinite mercy and grace still gives them uh, still gives them an opportunity. Even though they were warned several times before what was going to happen. In chapter 31, Israel will fall away. Chapter 30, restoration is promised of Deuteronomy. Even though they were, they were warned what was going to happen, even though he still gives them a chance at the chance at the chance. So this is the this is the this is the part that we have to, in verse 20. We're going to close with this. If you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. As in one final spot to for Isaiah to say, look, this ain't me talking. God using me as his mouthpiece. God's pretty cool. He hired a lawyer, didn't have to pay him, and the man prosecuted. And God said, God the plaintiff to say, hey, I'll give you a break. If. If. If ifs and buts were candy and nuts, it'd be Christmas all year long. Basically, we have two choices, <clears throat> which means there's no middle ground for all you people out there in Facebook land and people who are sitting here in sanctuary. There's no middle ground. You either choose God or you don't. I just want to make sure that I can, I don't have my contact or glasses on. I want to make sure I read this right. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the night of the Lord has spoken. Okay. I only see two options. Do you see two options? Do you see two options? There's only two options, right? Yeah. You either obey or you don't. Right? Those are the two options. I just want to make sure that no one else is going to read in between the lines and think that there's more than one, more than the two options. So you can obey God or you don't. Those are that's it. There ain't no middle ground. Ain't no maybe. You know when I was <laughs> you know you know those those little notes you pass. Well, you might not have done this back in your day, but in my day when I was in school, we passed notes. Check yes or no. We did to. Oh, okay. And then, and then, and then, and then the, the girl, sometimes she make a box and says maybe. <laughs> what does maybe mean? Maybe means no. That's what maybe means. <laughs> now, you know maybe. It's either yes or no. You know what I'm saying? So the fact of the matter is, is that the mouth of the Lord has spoken it, saying you have two options. Verse 20 is the, the latter of the two options. That's not the one you want to choose. You want to choose the first option. He gives you the best option first. He's a nice guy. Unfortunately, many people choose to refuse and rebel. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us two things. First thing it tells us, God desires reconciliation. Fellowship and communion with his creation. Awesome. Number two, unfortunately, we ain't good enough to get in heaven by ourselves. That's what that's what it also what it tells us. But if we obey his commandments, we follow his, his law, right? And we accept Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice and propitiation for our sins, we can hang out with God. If we don't, hate to take it. But we have the choice. He, he, he's not making it for us. And he's not me. He ain't gonna send nobody anywhere. He just wants people. Here's your options. You get to choose. It's like 
Little kids. If you know they don't like broccoli, you're still going to offer it to them, even though you know they don't like it. They may eat it, but you're still going to put a little plate in front of them. And if you don't eat it, you, do you get to eat anything else? Now what do you do? But back in the day, you either ate what was put on your plate or you didn't get to eat nothing. You went to bed hungry. The only problem is if you go to bed hungry here, you're going to be going hungry as hell. You know what I'm saying? So. Anyway. In the words of Forrest Gump, that's all I have to say about that. I hope you enjoyed that. I, uh, I, I, feel, I feel like I didn't study for this as much as I should have. Um, there's a lot of cross-referencing that, that needs to be done to really do an adequate study of this. And I feel, um, I feel like, in a way, it's kind of cheating ourselves. I feel like we could take Isaiah and we could, we could study it for like three years. Actually, it took us three years to get through Acts. And this had like three times as many chapters. So we, it might take us nine years to get through Isaiah if we were to preach through it. Uh, uh, some of you might not have that much time left. <laughs> uh, but I really hope this inspires you guys to, to go and um, study and prepare for next week's lesson. Because we're going to get into the call of Isaiah. And we're going to get into how God calls us. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the background of Isaiah and who he was, hopefully, and, and learn a little bit more about, about his, his prominence in the Bible as far as where he's at and the importance of the book of Isaiah. Because what we have to understand is, is that Israel, they fell away. <laughs> Almost from day one, there was really not really a whole lot of hope for them when they split away. But Judah was always where Jerusalem was, and that was, that was God's chosen city. You know, there's going to be a new heaven, there's going to be a new earth, and there's going to be a new Jerusalem. And the most beautiful part about this is that this is written in this book right here. I hope everybody reads and studies and prepares so we can have an awesome lesson. Be prepared to ask questions. I don't have any way to see if any questions pop up on the screen and it's too far away for everybody else to see. So if you got questions, shoot me an email and then we'll, we'll answer them next week. I feel like Bill not a science guy. <laughs> Send your questions an email and I'll get back to you. Um, or uh, shoot me a message on Facebook. Let me know what your questions are and I'll do my best to, to answer them and, and get back to you. Um, but... If it's some complicated, long theological question, it may not be next week. It may take me a while to get you a good answer. So, but I will do my best. But let's um, let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for for Isaiah and um, his willingness to serve you. We thank you so much for this message tonight, as we are strengthened by it. Even though it's hard to hear sometimes, we need to hear the hard stuff because if we don't push ourselves, then we're going to stagnate. We're going to rest on our world, and that's not what you want us to do. We should always be seeking to be perfect, and you are perfect. So I pray that we are invigorated, we are encouraged, and uplifted, and edified to do what's right, to turn our hearts towards you, to serve you, and have the right motivation and motives to do so. We thank you for all things, and we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.